Chapter 19, please, as we continue our discussion of the verb system in Greek. Chapter 19. Uh, nothing new to be learned here. There's no memory work, no paradigms to learn. You've already learned, mastered. Um, the person number suffixes. So there's nothing new in this lesson in terms of the grammar. It is just a new way of forming the omega verb. The contract verb is a special subsystem of the irregular omega verb. And so we want to look today primarily at contract verbs, but also at another class of verbs that are called liquid verbs. A liquid verb is a verb whose stem ends in a liquid consonant. The liquid consonants in Greek are lambda, mu, nu, and rho. These are called by linguists liquid consonants. And if a stem ends in a liquid consonant, then certain changes occur that you need to be familiar with. Again, no memory work is involved here. You'll be able to recognize, translate, and parse uh, contract and liquid verbs. Right? What is a contract verb? A contract is a verb whose stem ends in a short vowel. And there are three possibilities. Please notice on page 123, we have three paradigm words. The first one is timao. Second is phileo. And the last is de lao. <coughs> A contract verb is a verb whose stem ends in the following short vowels, either an alpha, an epsilon, or an omicron. Those are the three sets that we need to talk about today. Okay? And what happens, gentlemen, in a contract verb is this stem vowel, when it is combined with a person number suffix or a connecting vowel, combines with that vowel. And that process of combining vowels in Greek is called contraction. Let me repeat. Let's say I want to form the first or the second person plural of phileo. I use my person number suffix and the appropriate connecting vowel. What is my connecting vowel before? A mu or a nu, it's an omicron. What is my connecting vowel before everything else? It's an epsilon. My stem ends in one vowel. Okay. So once again, contraction takes place when the stem of the verb and the connecting vowel combine. And that process of combining the stem vowel and the connecting vowel or the person number suffix is a process called contraction. And therefore, these verbs are called what kind of verbs? They're called contraction verbs. Now, by the way, I've stated for you the rules of contraction. They're found, the gentlemen, on the bottom of 122 and the top of 123. If you mind looking there for just a moment. The bottom of 122 and the top of 123. Now, you don't need to memorize any of this. In fact, sometimes I think memory is destructive of learning. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be very, very, very much aware of these. And I would read them over a couple of times at least. If you were to read this, you would see that an epsilon and an epsilon in Greek combine or contract to form an epsilon iota. So here's the second person plural of phileo. You see it there? Phileta. If phileo means I love, what will phileta mean? That's it. You love. You are loving. You are in the process of loving, or you love. See that there? That's all we are talking about here. Let's take another example. Fi, le, plus, omicron, plus, men. 
This is called a contract verb. What do I mean by contract verb? A contract verb is a verb whose stem ends in a short vowel. This short vowel combines with the connecting vowel. That process is called contraction. The rules of contraction are found where? On the bottom of 122, the top of 123. And if you were to read these, you would see in Greek an epsilon and an omicron combined to form what diphthong? And who? So what would be the first person plural? Put all this together. Bill. Philumen. If phileo means I love, philumen means we love. You see that? That's it. That's all we're talking about uh, when we talk about contract verbs. Now while we're on the verb phileo, let's take a look at the bottom of 123, shall we? Rather than going through all three columns, let's go through the middle column, if you will, on the bottom of 123. Here is the present active indicative of Luo. It goes like this. Philo, phileis, phile, philumen, phileta, phileusi. Let's translate those six forms. Philo, phileis, phile, philumen, phileta, phileusi. Translate. I love, you love, he loves, we love, you love, they love. Okay, drop down to the imperfect active indicative. By the way, can you please tell me what the person number suffixes are? Let's see. Looks like nu, sigma, nun, men, te, son. Look at the book. Don't say son. I don't see a son there. I see a nu, don't you? I see a nu, sigma, nun. I see a men, te, and a, and a nu. See that there? Let's translate these forms. Ephilum, ephiles, ephile, ephilumen, ephileta, ephilum. Let's translate. Begin. I was loving. Ephiles. You were loving. Good. Ephile. He was loving. Ephilumen. We were loving. Ephileta. You were loving and ephilum. They were loving. Turn the page. Let's look at the present, middle, and passive. Look at the middle column, please. My a tie metha sted untie. Have you seen those before? Yes, you sure have. Let's translate those. <coughs> Now, because these forms are capable of being middle or passive, let's do them as reflexive middles. Okay? Reflexive middles. So want to try that? Philumai. I. Reflexive middle. I am loving myself. Philae. You are loving <laughs> yourself. Philetai. He is loving himself. Philumetha. We are loving ourselves. Philistha. You are loving yourselves. Philuntai. They are loving themselves. Let's do all these six forms again, but this time let's do them as passives. Number one. I am. This is, this is called the present tense. I am being loved. Philae. You are being loved. Philae. He is being loved. Philumetha. We are being loved. that. You are being loved. Philuntai. They are being loved. Drop down to the next column. It says imperfect, middle, and passive. Let's do these as passives. This is the imperfect, passive, indicative. Ephelume. I was being loved. Ephelu. You were being loved. Ephelita. He was being loved. Ephelumetha. We were being loved. Ephelaste. You were being loved. And Ephelunta. They were being loved. Let's do the same words all over again. This time let's do them as the reflexive middle. Are you ready? Ephelume. I was loving myself. Ephelu. You were loving yourself, Ephelita. He was loving himself, Ephelumetha. 
We were loving ourselves. Efeleste. You were loving yourselves. Efelunta. They were loving themselves. Okay? No problem there. You should be able to translate and parse those without any difficulty whatsoever. And if you're interested, you know, I'm not saying you can't memorize the rules of contraction, but I never did. I never felt it was necessary. The more you translate uh, contract verbs, the easier it will become. In fact, eventually the rules will become intuitive. I didn't mean to look at the rules to do this. Eventually, the more familiar you can become with contract verbs, the more intuitive it will be. Okay? But please, as you read over the lesson carefully, please read over the rules of contraction. Also, very careful. Now, how do you form the other tenses of the contract verbs? I'm glad you asked. Look at the top of 125. Future active indicative. You see what's happening here? This is the future. Translate phileso. I will love. Right? If phileo means I love, phileso means I will love. Can anybody tell me what has happened to the stem vowel? Can anybody tell me what has happened to the stem vowel? Yes, it has lengthened. And in Greek, an epsilon lengthens to what letter, class? That's right. We have a short E and we have a long. Did you notice how there's a difference? There's a significant difference? Therefore, when you are pronouncing these letters, you want to do well. It should sound different, shouldn't it? Because in Greek, it makes a difference. It makes a big difference. This is an epsilon. This is an eta. Pronounce this word. So this means I will love. So what would this be? Philesimen. We will love. No problem there. Look at the future middle. Philesimai. Translate that as a middle. Let's do reflexive middle. I will. This is the middle voice. The reflexive middle. I will love myself. Look at the future passive. Philetheisamai. Let's see if we can do philetheisamai. I will be loved. Got it? There's really no problem. You are not learning anything new in this lesson. You are not learning anything you have not already learned. Let's look at the aorist. The aorist active. Ephileisa. Ephileisa. See? You see the stem vowel has lengthened? And at the, at, the, at the beginning of the word, I have had to, had to ask uh, to add what morphine? The past time morphine. So translate F like go. I love. Got it? I love. How about F me? Reflexive middle. I love myself. Good. How about F I was love. Good. Good, good, good. Let's look at the perfect system. The perfect system. Ephilica. It should be what? Reduplication. It should be what? Perfect. No, no. How should I have written it? Not pephilica, but. Pephilica. <laughs> you try saying pephilica. And, and you'd probably prefer saying pephilica, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. That process is called D. Aspiration. Good. It should be fifilica, but because of Grassman's law, remember we looked at that earlier, because of Grassman's law, one of those has to become deaspirated. Which one was deaspirated? The first one, right? Instead of fifilica, it's pephilica. You want to you try translating pephilica? Yeah. I I'm enough. have I'm enough. love. Good. How about pephilemai as a, as a reflexive middle? I have love. Myself. Good. How about Michele Mai as a passive? I have been loved or I am loved. Either one would work. I have been loved. I am loved. Go back, please, to page 123. Let's go over these again. I'm going to go much slower. If you want to jot down the translations, you're welcome to. Page 123. Middle call. Philo is I Love. Philae is you love. Philae is he loves. Philumen is 
we love. Philetta, you love. And Philusi is they love. That's the present active indicative. Drop down to the bottom of the page, the imperfect active indicative. Give me a philu. I was loving. And the idea is I kept on loving, right? I kept on loving. Ephiles, you were loving. Write down the translation if you want to, if you feel you need to. You don't need to, then don't write it. But if you feel you need to, just write it down. Ephile, he was loving. Ephelumen, we were loving. Ephelita, you were loving. And finally, Ephilu, they were loving. What are the person number suffixes? Nu, sigma, none, men, te, nu. Turn the page. Present, middle, and passive. Let's start with the passive. Philumai, the passive. I am being loved. Philae, you are being loved. Philetai, he was, he is being loved. How about Philumata? We are being loved. How about Philaste? You, you are being loved. And finally, Philuntai. They are being loved. Those are all passive, right? Let's try it as the reflexive middle. Same word, <laughs> reflexive middle. Okay? Philumai. I. You can either do, I love myself, or I am loving myself. Philae, you are loving yourself. Philetai, he is loving himself. Philumenta, we are loving ourselves. Philae, you are loving yourselves. And finally, full of time. They are loving themselves. Drop down to the imperfect middle and passive. Let's start with the passive. F L U M E. I was being loved. Yeah, make sure you got that. I was being loved. What voice is that? Passive. F L U. You were being. Ephelita, he was being loved. Ephelumetha, we were being loved. Ephelista, you were being loved. Ephelumtai, they were being loved. Let's do the same verbs again, please. This time let's do it as the reflexive middle. Ephelumi. I was loving myself, Ephelu. You were loving yourself, Epheleta. He was loving himself, Ephelumetha. We were loving ourselves, Epheleste. You were loving yourselves, Epheluta. They were loving themselves. Top of the next page. Translate. Phileso. I will love. Future middle. Reflexive. I will love myself. Future passive. Philethesomai. I will be loved. Eris, active, Ephilesa, I loved, middle, Ephilesa, me, I loved myself. Eris, passive, Ephilethane, I 
was love. Finally, the perfect system. Pephilica. I have love. Pephilimai. I have loved myself. Pephilimai. I have been loved. Or again, you could also do it. I am loved. By the way, can you hear the difference between I am loved and I am being loved? What tense is I am loved? Perfect. What tense is I am being loved? What I am being loved? Present. Can you hear the difference? Don't translate to present I am loved. That would be the what tense in Greek. The perfect tense, right? I am loved. I am being loved. I am in the process of being loved would have to be in what tense? The present tense. The present tense. Okay. So let me repeat. What is a contract verb? A contract verb is a verb whose stem ends in a short vowel. What are my three options? Alpha, epsilon, and omicron. What happens to these stem vowels when I attach a connecting vowel or a person number suffix that begins with a vowel. What happens? The vowels combine, and that combination is called by grammarians, and I refer to them in the third person because I'm not one, by grammarians, that's called contraction. Hence, the class of verbs we are now studying are called contract verbs, okay? Contract verbs. This stem vowel is what's throwing everybody off. See, that's the thing, the stem vowel. If there wasn't a stem vowel there, we wouldn't have a problem. That's what's giving us a headache right now. But it's not that hard, is it? We just saw it. It's not that bad. It's not that hard. It's not that bad. There are no new person number suffixes to learn. There are no new, you know, connecting vowels to learn. It's just same old, same old. It's just applying it to a different class of domain of verbs. Okay, now let's switch gears. We're going to switch gears to another class of verbs called what? Liquid verbs. A liquid verb is a verb whose stem ends in a liquid consonant. What are the liquid consonants? Lambda, mu, nu, and rho. Okay. A special type of irregularity in the Greek verb system involves verbs whose stem ends in one of the so-called liquid consonants. I don't know why they're called liquid consonants. Maybe because they just kind of flow off the lips. They just kind of run smoothly. And by the way, in languages, in languages, these, these tend to be confused with each other a lot. I know in Korean, um, like an M and an N, uh, uh, an M sound and an N sound are often hard to distinguish. And, and a lamb, uh, lambda and a rho are often difficult to uh, distinguish, like in Chinese or in Japanese or in Korean. They get them confused very, very easily all the time. Because they're so similar, they, they're all the same class of consonants. They're called liquid consonants. So um, I don't know why they're called liquid, but that's what they're called. So that's what we call them. All right. Now, let's talk about how the future and how the errors are formed. Uh, in fact, turn the page, if you will. i give you some examples. And let's, let's, let's look at meno. Meno. OK, let's look at meno. Meno is a new verb that we're learning in this lesson, and it is translated usually, I abide or I remain. Meno. I abide or I remain. Okay? Meno. I abide or I remain. Okay? Jesus said, abide in me as I in you. This is meno. And if you're looking at the farewell discourse, right, you're going to see this verb a lot. Uh, and by the way, the related, the related noun is very interesting. Um, this is the plural. In my father's house are many, are many abiding places, are, re, are many remaining places. This is this is the noun form of the verb. This means I abide or I remain, right? And in my father's house are many. You know, the King James does many mansions. Mansions. 
And so we're all looking forward to getting our mansion, aren't we? You know, you're going to have yours, and Apostle's going to have his, and I'm going to have my mansion. No, 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 no. This, this is a word which means living places or dwelling places. You can even translate it apartments. Because how many houses does the Father have? Huh? In my Father's house. And of course, when the son got married, they didn't go and build a new house. What they did was they just divided another room off. And that was a ma that was those are the manai. Those were the dwelling places, the apartments, you see. In the one house, there were many rooms. That's what he said. Uh, and by the way, I love the word for many. It means many different kinds. We haven't, we haven't seen that word yet, but it's a beautiful word in Greek. It many different kinds. There's going to be there's going to be manai for the rich people and for the poor and for the educated and the uneducated, for the Jews and the Gentiles and for the women and for the men, right? That's right, in the body of Christ, you have all different kinds of people, right? And Jesus is going to prepare those for us right now. He's preparing those for us, those mana, those dwelling places, where we are going to what? I will abide in the house of the Lord for forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord um, forever. By the way, we've done Bible. We're starting Bible memory work down in Alaba, down in... Uh, Hosanna and down in Virgin. And it was so great to see uh, on Sunday after church yesterday, Almond had passed out all the verses to the children a week ago. And they have to memorize, not verses, they have to memorize passages of scripture. Then when Becky and I come back, we're going to give them a free Bible if they do these passages. Free, uh, free and Eric Bible. And the first passage was Psalm 23. And they, they got it last Sunday. And Apostle was there. He heard them rattling it off. Just, just... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want him. Just in that merit. They just boom, 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 boom. And about ten of them won, you know, won, won their prize. That, the prize that day was I drew their portrait. And after they do all of these verses, all these passages, uh, in December they get a free Bible. And we're doing that in the lava, and we're doing that in Virgin, and we're doing that in, in Bobicho. So it's going to be neat to see how many of them win. They were so excited, weren't they, to yeah. say their verses. They were so proud of themselves. They took a week and memorized perfectly Psalm 23. Amazing. Now, we're not making them, we're not asking them to memorize individual verses of scripture. They're memorizing passages, whole passages, intact passages. And don't tell me children can't do it. Children have phenomenal memories. They, they can acquire things just like that. It takes me a lot longer. And the older you get, the harder it is, isn't it? Some of you are like like with the vocabulary in this class, right? The older we get, the harder it is to, to remember things. Let's look at mental. Uh, let me start with the heiress. In the heiress, I would take the men. You see, get rid of the, you get rid of the person over suffix. You add the past time morphing, and you add the sigma alpha. This would be the way I would form it, like luo al, lu, su. So what is the heiress of luo? Elusa, right? Translate elusa. I, loose. So what should be the heiress of meno is emensa. Should be emensa. See that? Just like Elusa, it should be Emensa, but it, it, it's not Emensa. Now, let me try to explain what's going on here. It's even difficult for me to explain. But here's what's going on, I think. Remember we told you something about sibilant sounds in Greek? In, in some words, the Greeks did not like sibilant sounds. They didn't like S's. And so they tried to do what? They tried to get rid of them. And here's an example of where they got rid of it, okay? When... The verb end today, what kind of a consonant? A liquid consonant. What are the liquid consonants? Lambda, mu, nu, or rho. What is this consonant? A nu. Is this a liquid consonant? Yes. When the stem of the verb, let me repeat, when the stem of the verb ended in a liquid consonant, this sigma was dropped. Okay? That's step number one. Step number two. To compensate for the loss of the sigma, this vowel lengthened. Now look in your book. Do you see what the heiress of meno is? Do you see there on the chart? Do you see it there? We're on page 126. Can you find the heiress of meno? Yeah. Now here's something I want you to notice. In Greek, an epsilon can lengthen in two ways. One of them we've already seen today, right? Here's the other way. So let me repeat. In Greek, an epsilon can lengthen in one of two ways. 
Now the spelling is different, but what, what is the same is the what? The pro pronunciation. Please pronounce this. A. A. Please pronounce this. A. A. And which one is used here? Which one? Is it the eta or is it the diphthong epsilon iota? It's the epsilon. So here's the errors. And may not. Here's the errors that blue O. L lu sub. Translate L lu sub. I lose. lose. Translate M, M may not. I. This is a by or, a, or remain. So I. I don't know what it is. What is it in the English? Help me. I. Aboded. No, that didn't work. That didn't sound right. I abode. That didn't sound right either, but it's probably right. I abided. How about this? I remained. Would that work? Yeah, let's just use I remained. I abide or I remain. This is I remained. See that there? I remained. Now, watch this. Is this verb a first or second error? <laughs> A first eris. You see, the sigma alpha is there, but what happened? Did the sigma drop down? But it's still considered a first eris. Okay? It's still considered a first eris. Now, why am I saying this? I'm, I'm mentioning this only for this reason. Grammarians will refer to this kind of verb in one of two ways. Either as a liquid first eris. Does that make any sense? A liquid first eris. Or the other way that they will describe a verb like this is called, now see if you can understand this long word, asigmatic eris. Asigmatic, which means it lacks the letter sigma. Okay? An asigmatic eris or a liquid first eris. That's neither here nor there. You don't need to remember any of that. I mention it only for one reason. As you begin to study second year Greek, the grammarians will refer to verbs like this as an asigmatic eris or a liquid first error, so you probably should be familiar with that terminology. Okay. Now let's talk about the future. What in the world happened in the future? Okay. Well, menso, it should be menso, right? This would be the future. Menso becomes meneso becomes Men, epo, the sigma drops out, and then these two letters combine or contract to form, watch this, to form the no. Let me take you through these steps again. Menso, it should be benso, right? You add the future time morphine. Becomes meneso, the sigma drops out, and contraction takes place. And an epsilon and an omega, when they combine, form an omega. And when contraction, watch this now, when contraction takes place, the accent mark will always appear on the contraction. Now that's very important for you to notice, for the simple reason that meno means what? I abide or I men, but meno, I will abide or I will remain. The future of, listen now, the future of meno is Meno. Can you hear the difference? The future of meno is meno. And I've described the, the changes here. By the way, these changes are described on 125. Would you please look at 125? Bottom of 125. A special type of irregularity in the Greek verb system involves verbs whose stems end in one of the so-called liquid consonants. Lambda, mu, nu, or rho. In the future of liquid verbs, are you following me? <coughs> follow, follow in your text, please. An epsilon is inserted between the liquid consonant and the future time morphine sigma. Then the sigma, as usual between two vowels, is dropped. And the epsilon is contracted or combined with the vowel of the ending. For example, meno, the future of meno, is formed as follows. It's just exactly what I put on the board now. Menso becomes meneso, which becomes meneo, which becomes meno. 
men only. Okay? All right. Now, do you need to memorize all that? No. But if you'll turn the page, you do need to become familiar with this chart. Here are the most important liquid futures and errors. It's in the New Testament. Let's just run through them real quickly, okay? Page 126 at the top. On Gelo, the future is on Gelo, and the aorist is ein Gela. You notice it's still a first aorist, but it lacks what letter? Ein Gela lacks what, lacks what letter? Sigma. Iro becomes Aro and Aira. Apocteno becomes Apocteno and Apectena. Apostello becomes Apostolo, Apestela. Egero becomes Egero and Egera. Crino, I judge, becomes Crino and Ekrino. Meno becomes Meno and Emena. Those were the forms that we just looked at. And finally, Spero becomes Spero and Espera. And what's the noun form? What is that which has been sown? It's called a spare ma. Remember that? Spare ma. Okay, C. Okay, so we've looked at two classes of verbs today. We've looked at contract verbs and we've looked at liquid verbs. What is a contract verb? A contract verb is a verb whose stem ends in a short vowel. What are the three options that we have? We have, they're no longer here. What are they? An alpha? an epsilon, and an omicron. What makes the contract verbs problematic is that what happens with this stem vowel is it combines with whatever vowel follows it, whether it be the contract vowel or the person number suffix. This process of combining vowels in Greek is called what? Contraction. Therefore, this class of verbs are called what kind of verbs? They're called contract verbs. Okay? Contract verbs. Secondly, we have a class of verbs called liquid verbs. Why are they called liquid verbs? Because these are verbs whose stem ends in one of the four liquid consonants. What are the liquid consonants? Lambda, mu, nu, and rho. And when you have a, uh, a liquid verb, certain changes take place that you need to be familiar with. Okay, you need to be familiar with. Primarily, it, the, what letter is dropped? What letter is dropped? The sigma. The sigma is dropped. For whatever reason, apparently the Greeks did not like sibilant sounds. They didn't like sigma. And when possible, not always. Remember, sometimes they added it, remember? Like, what is the future passive indicative of akua? Akustesimai. Remember that? Akustesimai. Say, where did that sigma come from? I don't know why they added it there. Sometimes they would add a sigma for the sake of euphony or the sake of ease of pronunciation or the sake of ease of enunciation. Normally, they tried to get rid of it. Normally they try to get rid of it. As I as I illustrated before, this is a this is a a prefix in Greek. This is the identical prefix in Latin. The Latins didn't have trouble with this sound. This was originally sami. What happened to the sigma? It dropped out. And by the way, at the beginning of a Greek word, when a sigma drops out, it is replaced by what reading mark? What's this one called? The rough reading mark. Pronounce this, please. Hey, me. Pronounce this. Semi, right? Have you heard the word hemisphere? Have you heard the word semicircle? Yes. What's the difference? Nothing. They mean identical. They mean exactly the same thing. Hemisphere is an English word that comes from what language? Greek. Semicircle is a language. Is a word in English that comes from what language? Latin. That's the only difference. Hemisphere means half of a what? A half of a globe or half of a circle, doesn't it? That's all it means. And that's how you can account for those differences, hemi and semi. Hemi and, hemi and semi, they mean exactly the same. Right. Any questions to this point? I know you haven't had a chance to read the lesson yet, but any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, when we see the verbs, we pass it as the verbs. Yes, sir. They have to follow the same pattern, or how do we pass? Um, we have, we will not, be, we'll see in the vocabulary with that in just a minute that we don't have it anymore in this class. I don't think there's a single one. Yeah. 
Good. Anything else? If not, let's look at the vocab. Contract verbs of the tamao type. What do I mean by the tamao type? These are verbs whose stem end in what short vowel class? And in alpha. Okay. What do I mean by tamao type? Let's go back to page 125, please. Bottom of 125. You see the left hand column? That's your pattern word for all these verbs. Tamao means I honor. I honor. And tomorrow is your pattern word or your paradigm word for all these verbs that we're about to introduce in the vocabulary, okay? That's what that tomorrow refers to. All right, let's look at these verbs. Aga, pao, I, love, with divine altruistic self abnegating and selfless love. Is that what that means? <laughs> huh? You ever heard that? Agape love is a special form of love. Used for divine love and selfless love, right? Oh, you've heard that, haven't you? Well, we'll talk about that. I have a whole talk I'm going to give later on on John 21. Do you love me? And the difference between agapao and phileo, okay? And we'll discover what I call sloppy agape is alive and well in New Testament circles. Agapao, I love. Genao, I give birth to. Epitamao, I rebuke. Erotao, I ask. Zaho. Oh, now here's a deponent future. But if you look at the future, everybody, make sure you understand that in this particular verb, the future is deponent. Okay? Yes. I had forgotten that I actually add them here. When there's a deponent form, I will add them. And in the future of Zao is Zesamai. Please translate class Zesamai. Mine. Translate I will. This a my. I will. I will live. Right. Why is it I will live? Because in the future, this verb is what? Deponent. You see that? This is what we call a deponent future. Okay, there's no zeso. The only form in the New Testament that'll appear will be what? Zesa my. What is the definition class of a deponent verb? Help me out. A deponent verb is one which is middle or passive in. But active in? Good. So look at Zesa my. My. Doesn't have any meaning, right? Don't, don't think it's a middle. Don't think it's a passive. It's a verb that functions as what kind of a verb? An active verb. Why? Because it is a deponent verb. What is the definition of a deponent verb? It's a verb that is middle or passive in form, but active in function. Please make a note of that. You might want to circle that. Keep that in mind. That Zaha is deponent in the future. Merim nao. I worry or I am anxious. Be anxious for nothing, right? Be anxious for nothing, but worry about everything. I'm just kidding. Okay. Nikao, I overcome. And by the way, here it is. Everybody's favorite verb. Apao. Apao. Huh? Oh, hurrah, sorry. I see. And by the way, please notice in the future it's deponent. See that there? Opsimai. Translate opsimai. I will see. Please make a note that the deponent future of Horado is opsimai. Okay? Please make a note of that, otherwise you'll forget. Nao is I deceive. And Temao, I honor. Okay? By the way, that's your parody word. That's your pattern word, to ma'o. Contract verbs of the phileo type. Notice how many there are. Notice how many of this type there are. That's, that's one of the reasons I used it as our pattern, okay, today. Akal lutheo, I follow. Jesus said, follow me, right? That's the verb. Aiteo, I ask. Asteneo, I am weak. Blasphemeo. When you do it toward a human being, you translate it, I revile. When you do it toward God, you translate it, I... You cannot blaspheme a human being, right? But you can revile, can't you? Or slander a human being. Deo, I bind or I tie. Diakaneo, I serve. Top of the next page. Da keo, 
I think or I see. Docketism. It's from docket or docketism. How do you pronounce that? Docetism. What is that? Jesus only seemed to have a, a human body. And their word that the verse they hated the most, these docetics, was what? John 1.14. The word. And not only the body, the Greek doesn't say the word became flesh, it says the word flesh became. Remember that? Flesh became, and flesh is emphatic. The word became what? It came in contact with what? God, God can't do that. God cannot. God, a holy God, cannot come in contact with uh, flesh. And so they denied that Jesus had come in the flesh. Where do we see this teaching reflected? What book of the First, John. Epicaleto, I call upon. Eulogeo, I bless. By the way, the you part means what? Means well. Like in you, Angelion. And the logia part is from logos. That means, or from lego, it means I speak well. Do you know what a eulogy is? Have you ever been to a funeral? I don't know. Do you give eulogies here? When somebody dies, somebody gets up and says a whole bunch of lies about that person? <laughs> you know? That's called a eulogy. It's called a eulogy. Remember the story of the, the boy, they had just lost his dad, and they were, they were at the funeral, and someone was giving the eulogy, and the mother was sitting there with a little boy. And as that guy was talking, the boy said, Mom, is that dad you're talking about? <laughs> eulogy. Eucharistero. I give thanks, or I thank. And notice it is used with what case? The data. So if I, if I say, I thank God, then the word God needs to be in the dative case. Okay, you see what that means? So it's with the dative. So if I say, I thank God, then the word God needs to be in the dative case. All right? Zeteo, I seek. Theoreo, I see or I perceive. Kaleo, I call. Now, please notice the future and the errors break the rules. Can anybody tell me how it breaks the rules? Why did I put these two forms here? Because they break, they break the rules. Can anybody tell me what these forms should be? Quote, unquote, should be? Kaleo. What happens to that stem file in the future? Watch this. Fair. The future is phileso, isn't it? Please translate phileso. I will. Love. What happens to the stem file? It like this. this verb breaks the rules. See it there? What should the future be? Ka leso. What is it? Ka leso. I've lost you. You're beginning to see those stares, those blank stares, and those glazed over eyes. All right. Filetto is what kind of a verb? Ka. Uh, Contract verb. What happens to the stem vowel in the future tense? It will lengthen. To what letter? So the future of phileo is phileso, right? What happens to the stem vowel? It lengthens. Do you see now what the future should be of kaleo? should be kaleso, right? But it, it is instead what? Kaleso. By the way, notice the first errors. Same thing. It should be what? And Call lesa. Instead, it is what? And call lesa. Now, why did they do that? I don't know, except to make it hard on first year Greek students. That's the only possible reason I can think of. But Uncle Dave, being the kind and generous man that he is, has informed has informed you about it. So make a note of it. Crotel, I grasp where I take hold of. Well, I'll let all I speak as in glossolalia. By the way, what we call glossolalia, what you call glossolalia, is not biblical glossolalia often, because glossolalia in the New Testament is what we call xenolalia. Have you heard the distinction yet? All right, well, ask your theologian professors. I'm, not, I'm, I'm a New Testament professor. I'm just a professor of Greek. But you ask your theology professors sometime, what's the difference between glossolalia and senolalia, and which one is in the New Testament? Martyreo, I testify or I bear witness. Metadaeo, I repent. Miseo, I hate. 
Oikada meho. I build up or I edify as an oikos, which is a house. Barakaleo, I urge or I exhort or even I comfort. Peri pateo, I walk. I walk. By the way, I don't like the NIV here. All right? When Paul says, in Ephesians 4 1, that you are to walk in the manner worthy of the gospel. And then when someone translates live, if they say live, I'm inclined to think the Greek word was what? Not peripatel, but what's a new one that you have in Zao. Zao means what? I live. What does peripatel mean? I walk. Where, where did Paul get the concept of the Christian life as a walk? From, from what culture? From the Jewish culture. Right? In the Old Testament, your life, a life was described as a walk. In fact, there's a word halakha. Have you heard the word halakha? That describes your walk. And this is a Semitic concept. It's a beautiful Semitic concept. Life is a walk. One step after the other. That's what life is. And have you ever asked anybody, how's your Christian walk doing? We say this in English all the time. How's your Christian walk? What we mean, we, we don't mean just their Christian life. We mean, how, how are you making what? Progress. And how do you make progress? Three steps forward and two steps back. Isn't that how you make progress? Yeah, that's how I make progress. You know, you make a little bit and, you, and then you... I don't know, do you, do you have stock? Is there a stock market here? Do you know what a stock is? Can you buy a stock? Purchase a stock? Okay. If you're buying a stock, it doesn't matter where it's selling that day. It could be down from yesterday. Yesterday it could be, sold, be selling at 400 burr, and today it's selling at 200 burr. It doesn't matter. The question is about the bottom line. Over a period of a year, is that line going up or is it going down? If it is going up, that's called a healthy bottom line, and therefore the stock is what kind of a stock? A healthy stock. If it's going down, it's an unhealthy bottom line, and you stay away from stocks. And I think, don't you think that's a good description of the Christian life? I think this is the normal Christian life. Three steps forward and two steps back. But the main question is the direction of your life. What direction are you going in, right? In other words, if, if your marriage is not stronger this year, this time, than it was a year ago, there's something wrong with you. Right? Yeah. That's right. If you're not a better dad today than you were a year ago, there's something wrong. You ought to be growing as a dad, right? And as, and as, a, as a husband. That's right. And if it's going the other way, then you better wake up and smell the roses. There may be something wrong here. Because we need to be walking. We need to be walking. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And that's called progressive sanctification. Now, I know some of you believe in instantaneous. Some of you have experienced the second blessing, and you are perfect, and you're sanctified. I appreciate that. I think that's great. I wish I could be. But I, I really do. I really do. But I'm not. Okay. My Nazarene friends, they're perfect. They're sanctified. They have had the second blessing. Me, I'm still muttering along. <laughs> Three steps forward and two steps back. Now, why am I saying this? Here's the problem. In the exercises, you're going to see Perry Patel, right? And some of you are going to look it up in what translation? The NIV. And what's the NIV going to say? The NIV never translates this as walk. It doesn't say walk in a manner worthily of the gospel. It'll say what? Live. And then on the, on the quiz, you're going to do what? You're going to write, I live. And what is Uncle Abba David going to do? He's going to go like this. Shoom. Shoom. Got it? I don't care what the NIV, in fact, I don't care what the English says. You're learning Greek. Some of, some of you asked me a question before class today. You know, and, and you were translating one of those exercises. You said, but no English translation does it like the Greek. So the Greek is wrong. <laughs> no, 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 it's the opposite, folks. The Greek is right, and I don't care if no other English translation does it that way. You follow the Greek, right? That's what you follow? And let the Greek judge the translations. Yes, sir? That's, uh, you know, we, 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 we don't have the... Uh, the New Testament, and we, we, we can't preach it that way. So, preach it? 
which is a right um, translation? Uh, I, I mean, which is a more... Yeah, very, very good question. Which is the better translation? May I say this? For the purpose, I'm not against the NIV. What I'm saying is this. For purposes of, when you've done your exercises, you want to check it with English, stay away from what we call idiomatic or paraphrases. Stay away from those, right? Stick with what we call, what, what's the opposite kind of translation called? A literal. And what are the literal? We were talking about this, Jan and I were talking about this at break. What are some literal English translations? List them for me, class. You know of any? King James Version. Huh? New Revised Version. Old Revised, the Revised Standard Version of 1952 would work, right? Have you heard of the American Standard Version? Have you heard of the New American Standard Bible? Yeah, those would be the ones you want to use. Because they will translate Peripatel as what? As walk. And that's, that's how you should translate it. Is there a Greek verb for live? It's all. If Paul wanted to say live, he would have said live. He didn't want to say live. He wanted to say walk. Why? Because that brings up a whole word picture, right? A whole word, wonderful word picture, a metaphor. The Christian life is a walk. It's a walk. So, very good question. I would, I would stick with the more literal translations. Now, what's the official translation here? The NIV, right? Okay, the NIV. And why did they do that? Because what is the reading level of the NIV? Do you know what the reading level is in English? It's eighth grade. <laughs> did you know that? It's seven slash eight. It's seven slash eight. And you say, well, that's helping the student, right? Because their English is a little poor and they need a little... No, I think it's hurting the student. It's going to hurt you. Because what, what you're going to realize is you've been reading the NIV all along, and now that you have the Greek, you're going to begin to compare it. You're going to say, wait a minute. That's not what it says at all. So my encouragement would be for you to purchase, if you can, if you can, purchase a literal English uh, a translation. And I wish you all had access to the Internet, because these are all available free of charge on the Internet. I mean, every Bible translation is available in any language. I, read, I can read the German, the French, the Spanish, the Italian, the Portuguese. I can read anything I want on the internet free of charge. You can print it out free of charge. It's amazing what a tool that is, but I understand you don't have that. Okay? So go to the library and maybe check out a Bible. That's a literal translation. Poieto. Poieto. I do or I make. Here's a good verb. Proskunel. Worship. Terel. Keep. Philel. Oh, I thought we had a verb for love. Agapao. So what's the difference? That's a good question. We'll talk about that later. Phoneo, I call, related to phone, which is a voice or a sound. Contract verbs of the de lao type. Finally, de lao is I show. Dikai ao is I justify, and it's related to that long word. Dikai asune, which means and by the way, can you give me righteous, the adjective? Dikaios. Dikaios, right? Play rao, I fill or I fulfill. Stel rao is I crucify. Teleao is I perfect or complete. Fane rao is I reveal. Finally, we have these liquid verbs. On yellow, I announce. Iro, I take up. Anabino, I go out. Apakteno, I kill. Apostello, I send. Bino, I go. And notice in the New Testament it's always compounded. In other words, it's always you're going to be anabino or katabino or ace bino or whatever, right? Ek bino. It'll always be compounded with the preposition. Also note, please, the deponent future basemai. Please underline that. If, be, if bino is I go, what is basemai? I will Go. It is deponent. And then I've given you the second aorist. Ebbing. Ebbing. Egero is I raise. Thelo is I want. Notice the future. Thelesa, an aorist, a thelesa. Katabino is I go down. I descend. Crino is I judge. Meno is I remain. And Spero is I so. Let's take a, it's 10 15, but let's take a 30 minute break. I will see you at a quarter to 11, gentlemen. And work through some of these exercises together.
Okay, we are on page 128. We're looking at numbers 1, 5, 6, 10, 12. And 15 was a little on the challenging side, so we're going to put that one on the board, okay? Show you how it works. All right, who will give us number 1 today? Read the Greek and translate. Do I have a volunteer? Would anybody like to try it? Ah, who thinks they got it right? Okay, Jan, could you read the Greek and then translate for us, please? Okay, good, thank you. What's your translation? Then you will, you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Okay, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I like that, but uh, did anybody do it any differently? Anybody do it? Marcos, how did you do it? And he will call his name Jesus, for he himself saves the people from their sins. Well, okay, you corrected one thing, and then <laughs> but introduced an error in another place. Everybody look at the second clause, please. The second clause, just after the comma. Kaikaleses ta anama atu yesu kama. Now what's the next word? Altos. Okay, put your thumb over altos, everybody. Or your finger, you can use either one. Put your finger over altos. Some of you aren't doing it. You're being disobedient, recalcitrant, reprobates. See the word altos? Cover it up. Now go to sose and translate sose. Now it's not so say, Marco. So say would be present tense. So say is what tense. Yeah. Translate so say. Go. He will say. Good. Now take your finger off of Altos. Don't leave Altos untranslated. Okay? Now translate. He himself will say. Good. Your translation was perfect, Dan. You just need to translate the Altos. That's all you need to do. And you will call his name Jesus, for he himself will save his people from their sins. By the way, we have two completely different uses of the future here. <coughs> and this is all chapter 3 stuff, so you may have forgotten. But I can use the future tense to say what will happen in the future. This is the predicted future. In Greek, I can also use the future tense to issue a command. Did you know that? It's called the imperatible future. And both of these are in this verse. You see them there? Which one is the command? And which one is the prediction? Which one is the command, the first or second? That's right. That's right. In, in other words, Greek can use the future tense as a command. Did you know that? In fact, the Ten Commandments, or there are actually nine of them that are repeated in the Greek New Testament, Nine of them all use the future indicative, right? You shall not murder. You will not murder. Is that a prediction? No. Will people murder? Yes, they will. It's not a prediction. It's a what? A command. Therefore, what would be another legitimate way of translating that instead of you will not murder? Well, in English, we used to, we used to make a distinction between will and shall, right? One was prediction. One was command. Thou shalt not murder, right? But we don't make that distinction anymore. So what would be another way in English of saying do not murder? Yes. You must not murder. You are not to murder. Okay? Now come back to number one here. Do you see the first thing? The angel's giving a command, right? What was Joseph, what was Joseph going to name? I don't know. I think he probably picked out a name, right? But it doesn't matter, Joseph. You are, to, you are to name him what? Jesus. Yeshua. Right? What does Yeshua mean? Jesus. Yeah, I know it means Jesus, but Jesus. what does Jesus mean? Jesus. <laughs> the Lord Jesus. saves. Do you see how beautiful this is? You are to name him the Lord saves. For it is Altos. He and he alone who will save his people from their sins. They tell me that Jesus was the third most common name in Israel in the first century. Everybody wanted to be known as Joshua. 
Joshua. You know, there's a lot in the name, isn't there? Everybody wanted to be known as Jesus. Jesus was a very common name. But what would make the naming of this Jesus distinct and unique was for the first time in human history, not only would this child's name mean the Lord saves, this child is the Lord who saves. Now, if you want to translate it that way, fine. By the way, here I think the NIV gets it right. I think the NIV gets it right. Who's got the NIV? Read it for us. Read the NIV. This is Matthew 1. 21. Who's got it? The new inspired version. Yes. King James. King James? Oh, no, I want the NIV. Yes. You will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Stop Jesus. right there. Did everybody hear that? You are to give. give him the name Jesus. Can you hear the difference between you will call this name Jesus? Now, it paraphrases a little too much. You are to give him the name, but the Greek says what? It doesn't say you will give him the name. It says you will call his name. But if you wanted to translate that, you are to call his name Jesus. Or if you wanted to translate that, you must call his name Jesus, that would be fine. Because it's a command. And the second one's a prediction, right? Why are you to call his name Jesus? Because he himself will do something in the future, right? That's a predictive future. He will save his people from their sin or sins. Make sure you have it as a plural. This is from the sin. Okay? Let's do the parsing class. Thank you, Jan. Excellent rendering. Let's do the parsing. Let's say, so are you ready? Begin. Future. Active. Indicative. Second. Singular. Singular. Now watch this. When you parse, always give the vocabulary form. Kaleho. This is called the uncontracted form. If I were to contract this and actually say, I call, the Greek would be kalo. But in giving the source, please, you must always give the uncontracted form. This is the form of your vocabulary. Okay, Just memorize this as a vocabulary form. So what is the source of kaleses? It is ka. Don't say kaleo. Listen, if you say kaleo, here's how you're going to spell it. I know it. If you say kaleo, that's how you'll spell it. Don't say kaleo. Say Kaleho. Can you hear the difference? It's very subtle. It is very subtle, but it's very important for spelling. See, Kaleho is the source and not Kaleso. Very good. Any other questions on number one? Good. Let's work on number five. Who would like to read the Greek and translate? Yes, sir. Emis agapit agapomen oti autos protos agapesin Emas. Thank you. We love him because first he loved us. Okay, let's stop right there. We love him. How many of you memorize it that way? When I was growing up, that's how I memorized this verse. We love him because he first loved us. That's how I memorized it. There's only one problem with it. Where's the end? Uh, where's the end? By the way, is there a textual variant that has a hymn? Do you think? Yes. If you were to go to your Greek Testament and look at it, there's a textual variant. And that's how it got into the King James. And the King James says what? We love him. Okay? Now, what's the problem with saying we love him because he first loved us? Problem number one, is there a hymn in the Greek? No. Problem number two, is there an autos in the Greek? Look at number five. Is there an autos? So it doesn't say because he first loved us. It says because he himself. Do you see that there? Don't leave the autos untranslated. It's we love. In other words, the reason we can love, right? Not him or it doesn't say who. But the reason there's love, the reason we have love. Why? It's because he himself First love us. Okay. How many of you left the altos out in your translation? Be honest with me. How many of you did not translate the altos? How many of you did translate the altos? How many of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> don't leave altos untranslated. I don't care what your English Bible says. Right? 
Just go, please go to number five, go to the second verb, the agape said. Translate agape said for me. He loves. Now pick up the altos, please. He himself loved. That is not one of those untranslatable riches from the Greek New Testament. All right, so translate it. Bring it out of your translation. Well, let's do the parsing class. Please go to the first verb, agapo men, and let's parse it together. Ready? Begin. It is present. Active, indicative. The men tells you it's what person in number? First, plural. And what is the source? Always give the uncompounded, the uncontracted source. It's from what verb? Agapao. Now, would a Greek ever say agapao? No, the Greek would always say the contracted form. Agapo. Remember I told you before, if you want to say I love you, it's agapo, said. Or say agapo. You would never say, you would never write agapao. But for quiz and test purposes, give what form? The un will be called the uncontracted form. That's the form in your vocabulary. You see that? Agapao is the source. Well, let's look at the second verb. Agape sin. Are you ready to parse it? Let's do it. Agape sin. Aorist, active, you can get epsilon nu. Third, singular from what verb? A, ga, pa, o. Good. Good, good. Come in, thank you. That was a good translation. Anybody else have a question on number five? Anything at all? Okay, how about number six? Who would like to read the Greek and translate? Anybody? Number six. Let Good. I'm writing to you, young man, because you have overcome the evil one. I like that. I am writing to you. Did anybody do it? I write to you. That would be fine. That would be fine. I am writing or I write to you, young man, because you have overcome. Now notice Tan Pani Ron is not neuter, but it's what? Tan Pani Ron. Can you tell me the gender? Can you tell me the gender? Masculine. Right? It's not you have overcome evil, but you have overcome the evil one. See? It's masculine. You have overcome the evil one. Okay? Well, shall we do the parsing? Do we need to do grapho? No, we don't need to do grapho. But do we need to do nenekekate? I think so. Nenekekate. Are you ready? Here we go. It is perfect, active, indicative. The te tells you it is second plural. Can anybody tell me the source? Ne ka o. Yes, it's an alpha stem contract verb. And please, when you write the source, make sure it is the uncontracted. In Greek, how would I say I overcome? Say it. Give me the contracted. Niko. Niko. You would never say Niko, but for test purposes, we want to know what the stem vowel is. So please, when you parse, always give the vocabulary form. And the vocabulary form is always the uncontracted form. All right, that was number six. Any questions on six? The next one is number 10. Who would like number 10? Did anybody get number 10? Nobody? Who hasn't gotten yet would like number 10? Who has not gotten yet? OK, that's good. Thank you. I'm curious. You will listen to the insult, hearing to Martin Kuhn, also. Good. Therefore, the chief priest asked Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. I like that. Therefore or then, right? Who can be therefore or then? The high priest or the chief priest asked, literally, the Jesus, right? But we would smooth that out to what? Ask Jesus about his disciples and 
don't, don't leave the second very untranslated. And about his teaching. Domestica, that was perfect. Let's parse the verb. It is a rote sen. A rote sen. Are you ready? All right, here we go. It is what tense? Eris. Active. Indicative. Epsilon nu. Third. Singular. Now let's see if we can find the source. Where would the source be? I'm looking for ask. Where would it be? It's the fourth word, isn't it, in the vocab? Is that right? So what is the source? E, ro, ta, o. There it is. E, ro, ta, o. Erotao is the source. Okay, you see how this works? Just go to your vocabulary for the source. Just go to the vocabulary for the source. Any questions on number 10? All right, let's go to number 12 and then we'll do number 15 together. Would anybody like number 12? Anybody? All right, then. Alpos, Garbo, Kater, Fide, Puma, Oti, Pumes, Eni, Elfi, Elfi, Lekate, Kai, Elfi, Teokate, Oti, Eko, Para, Tu, Teo,
Perfilecate. Ready? Begin. It is perfect active indicative. The te tells you it's what person and number. Second plural. And what is the source class? Say verb. Yeah. Fe, le. Oh, that's perfect active indicative second plural. Okay. It should be But what process has kicked in? Does anybody remember that fancy word? De aspiration. Okay? There's one too many aspirates, one too many breaths in that word. Pepis Are you ready? Pepis chukate. The goat. Perfect. Active. Indicative. Second. Plural. From what verb? Pistuo. Pistuo. Pistuo is the source. And then finally, ooh, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. X L Y. Raise thine hand. <laughs> huh? If you know the answer to this one. Who will parse? Correctly. Excel. Anybody? Anybody got it? Nobody got it? Am I going to have to do it? Somebody got it? Nobody got it? Anybody got it? Still nobody got it. <laughs> There's one over here. Go ahead. Parse it for us. Excel pop. Uh, Eris? It is Eris. Active indicative. Active indicative. Eris, singular. First. Singular. X. Ah, yes. That's the source. This air is active. Active. Make sure you jot that down. It's active. Indicative. First singular. And here's the source. X. Air. Ka. Ma. Please jot that down. X. Air. Ka. Ma. It's a compound of what verb? Air, ka, mine. The compound of air, ka, mine. Okay? So, ex air, ka, mine means I come out. Ex elephant means I came out. I came out from God. I came forth from God, is what Jesus says. Okay? All right. Very good. Well, let's take a look at 15, shall we? Now, the problem with 15, I mean, if there's a problem, it may not be a problem. But the problem with 15, as I see it, is that you have what we call an embedded clause. You see it there? That, that clause, called a temporal clause, having to do when something happened, right, is embedded. So I'm going to leave it out for now, and let's see what we can do with the rest of the sentences, okay? What do I do with hoi? Why? What do I do with un? Why? It is what part of speech? Conjunction. Stratiotai is in what case? Nominative. Talibon is what part of speech? Verb. Tahimatia. Now, problem. What gender? Neuter, neuter can either be nominative or accusative. Which one? Am I going to underline this? Can you tell from the context yet? Once or twice? Twice. 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 Sit there? Twice. Because I already have a what? Subject. How to is in what case? The genitive case. Genitives are leftovers. Kind of conjunction. The poisson is a verb. And tessera mere is the object of this verb. Okay, the object of that verb. All right, let's see what we can do. Translate hoi stratiotai. The soldiers. Go to the verb with which those words, those words belong. Though the soldiers took. Got it? Stop right there. You can, you can leave this out for now because it's a clause, but it's embedded. You see how it's stuck in there? It's stuck in there. Take it out. The soldiers took, what did the soldiers take? The garments, right? The garments. 
I'll do of him. him. Let's move that out. The soldiers took his garments, his clothes. The soldiers took his clothes and made four parts. This is from Meros. Remember that? It's from Meros. The soldiers took his garments and made four parts. Stop right there. You see how this is working. Now let's go to our embedded clause. When did the soldiers take his clothes? When they crucified Jesus. See that? When they crucified Jesus. That's when they did this. Now, what's the best way to put it together? I, I don't know. I honestly don't. If we try to follow the Greek, maybe we would do something like, oh, we have to pick up this word. What's this one? Yeah. Therefore, then. I think then might work better here. Then the soldiers, comma, when they crucified Jesus, comma, right, took his garments and made four parts. Would that work? Yes, yes that would work. Let me repeat that. Then the soldiers, comma, when they crucified Jesus, comma, took his garments and made four parts. Okay? Remember he had a cloak, he had a tunic, he had a belt, and he had shoes. That's what you wore. That's what you wore. Oh, there was one more thing. There was one more thing, but they didn't want to rip that into four pieces, so they did what instead? They cast lots. Remember that? What was the other piece of garment that, that they had placed on him? His what? His robes. Okay? But otherwise, you wore a tunic that was like a t-shirt, right? And an outer garment, a long outer, outer garment, and it was a belt, and there were shoes. And they took that, and they, there, were four, they got, there were four guys, and they said, you take this, I'll take this, and they divvied it up. And then there was that robe, right? That seamless robe, and they didn't want to go. So they said, okay, let's, let's keep it intact, but let's cast lots to see who gets that one, remember? Remember that? By the way, we showed the Jesus film on Saturday at, in a lobby, in the village of a lobby, in, in that little tiny church there. And it was so neat to see that, do you remember that scene? That scene where they're casting lots for it. Let's do the parsing, then we'll open it up for questions here. Parsing, let's see, what's our first word? Eh, sal, ro, son. Let's parse it together. You think you got it? All right, what tense is it? Arrows. Voice and mood. Active indicative. Third person. Plural. From sal. Notice it is sal, rao. See the Omicron? Sal, rao. This is what the source is. Always give the uncontracted source. This, this stem is, ends in one vowel, and Omicron. This is what we call an Omicron stem contract verb. You don't need to know all that, but you do have to have the parsing correct. Sal, Ra, always the source. What's our next verb? Elevon. All right, let's see if we can do Elevon. Ready, begin. Aorist, active. Indicative. The form permits first singular or third plural. Which one is it? Third plural. And what is the source? Lam bano. See it there? Lam bano is the source. Lam bano. All right, we've got how many more verbs? One more. E poi e san. Can you see it's Aris? It's got to be. Aorist, active, indicative, third, plural from poi, eo. Don't say eo, poi, eo. Poi, eo. Okay. All right. Let's look at the exercises, page 128. It says this. 
page 128, exercises 128. It says this, study the lesson carefully. You are not expected to memorize any paradigms. Instead, become familiar with the various contractions that take place in the present and imperfect tenses of contract verbs. B, memorize the vocabulary to this lesson. And C, translate the following. Now, once you have done your best to translate this, am I opposed to you consulting the English translations? No. But if you consult an English translation, please consult what kind of a translation? An idiomatic or a literal? Yeah, I think it will serve you better if you consulted a literal translation, such as the NRSV, the RSV, the KJV, the NKJV, remember? The ASV, the NASV. I think that would help you much more. All right, and be able to translate and parse these sentences. Okay? Now, I take them verbatim. I don't switch anything. Okay, so if you can translate and parse those verses, you will do this just fine. Questions? At all? Any questions at all? Let's find a word of prayer. You'll get two things back. You get two quizzes back today. You get the you get the key to both of those quizzes back today. And then, if you're interested in the Alava report, I'm going to put it right here. You can get a copy when you when you leave. If you're interested, to take one. If you're not, that's okay. Let's bow in prayer. Father, you've been so good to us. We don't deserve it, but we sure do appreciate it. We thank you for the weekend and for the blessing of each one of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and honor of serving you. We, again, we don't deserve it, but we're thankful for every gift that comes from your gracious hand. Father, I pray now that you dismiss my students with your love, with your joy, peace, with self-discipline, with time management, the things that they need, not only to do well in this class, but Father, I pray to excel in this class. Thank you for these good quiz scores that we've seen. Uh, the last two quizzes, thank you for all the hard work and the effort. I know it takes a lot of work, and I appreciate that. You just be good with them, and I'll praise you and thank you for having me. In Jesus' name.